quite an intro. I, I think I'm going to fire my comms director and hire you. <laughs> uh, being in Congress is a different experience. I think you uh, have witnessed firsthand uh, the, the problems we have with such a contentious time in history, where even inside of our own party, uh, we seem torn apart. Uh, I'm a simple Marine. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to witness history from this side of the aisle now when all of a sudden you go from being somebody who's used to just working with a team of people who wants to stay alive and accomplish a mission to a group of people that each individual has their own ideas of what they're trying to accomplish, and some of them not always good. Um, I've been very flattered and, and humbled to meet generals now to come to my office, four-star generals coming to my office talking about policy, meeting uh, chancellors and prime ministers and presidents and rubbing elbows with ambassadors and people of great weight. But in the end, I'm still a Marine. And what's interesting, I, I used to always love my job and the fact that I could be so um, non-formal. Matter of fact, when I was a pilot, I got to wear pajamas to work, right? We wore onesie. You just zip it up and, and <laughs> off you go. And then I became an ER doc, and I'm still wearing pajamas. It was just a twosie. And I'm wearing my scrubs to work. And I always liked that, like the informality of, of getting a job done where it just roll up your sleeves, and every day there's something that you get to accomplish. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, the last couple of months have been depressing for me. Uh, when you're used to getting things done and, and you realize that even people inside your own party sometimes are working against getting things done, it gets very frustrating. And probably for the only second time in my adult lifetime, I kind of got depressed. Um, luckily, I've been recentered in the last week, and, and I found my footing, and I realized that this very much relates to being a veteran. Uh, you think about what just happened in Afghanistan. You think about us withdrawing and, in my, my opinion, a failure of a mission. We have 27 terrorist bases right now uh, training in Afghanistan. The Taliban are meeting with Putin. This is after 20 years, $2 trillion investment, 2,462 lives lost, countless brain injuries, countless limbs lost, countless months and years away from our family to see that kind of result. That's kind of how Congress is sometimes. Uh, you, you beat your head against the wall, and sometimes you don't get what you want. But the good thing about veterans is, no matter what the outcome is, you did your service. You answered the call. You gave your best. Because we're not guaranteed an outcome. We're not guaranteed an outcome for this nation, by the way. The only thing is guaranteed if you're in this chapel is you know the end of what's going to happen. And it's not good for this world but we will continue to fight the good fight. We'll keep the faith. We'll finish the race. That's our expectations as veterans. We have a higher calling. As a matter of fact, if you go to any graveyard in the United States, doesn't have to be a memorial graveyard, doesn't have to be a veteran's graveyard, any, mark my words, go to anyone, because I used to go with my kids when they're still living with me, and, and uh, we'd literally go and just look for a veteran. And it wouldn't take very long. And, and it would have a born date, when you died, and usually when you serve. It's the one thing you put on your gravestone besides when you died and when, you're, uh, when you were born. Uh, sometimes you put loving father, loving husband, whatever. But the fact that you put that on your tomb, even if you only served for a couple years, means you value that, that it was something that you took and put aside in your, in your life because it meant something different. It was something you didn't do for yourself. You did it for somebody else. And quite frankly, I talk about this all the time, See that my cat-like reflexes, I'm still got it. Um, <laughs> quite frankly, if you think about this, it's what makes you whole as a person. When you talk about how God designed you, even your faith is not about you. It's not about how good you are. God says you're not good. It's not about how well you understand the Bible. You're not perfect. We don't go to a church where it's a cult. We all have different opinions. Matter of fact, I, I really worry about people who come into church who think they know the Bible better than anybody else, who think they're better than anybody else, and divide the church because they think they define Christianity. We have the same thing in my party, I'll be honest with you. People who come in and say, I define the party, I understand the conservative movement better than anybody else. It worries me that we think that way because we fought a very difficult war back in 1776 going forward that took us about eight years to solve where we had a third of the people wanting freedom, a third of the people wanting to stay loyal, and a third of the people who are just trying to stay out of it. 
and yet we fought for years and years and years to come to a conclusion where we'd have the freedom of choice, where you'd have to be able to, the, the ability to throw your family in the back of a wagon, maybe starve, maybe freeze, maybe be killed, just to go west and discover your destiny. And because of that, we go coast to coast, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. We control our destiny, and we fought hard during a civil war where we lost hundreds of thousands of people. And we fought against brothers and sisters in order to keep this union. And veterans paid the price. We paid the price when George Washington had lost every battle up to a nighttime raid in which it was going very wrong, but it turned the tide of battle. And you couldn't even say we really won that per se, other than the fact that it gave us a glimmer of hope when we were down to just a few thousand soldiers left. And they were freezing, they were starving, they were undermanned, they were under uh, gunned. And yet from that came the most powerful nation that's ever existed in the world. A country that everybody wants to come to. A people that, I, I just went to a swearing in ceremony on the Marine Corps birthday yesterday. 20 different nations, people who waited in line, did it the right way, just like our ancestors did, to become American citizens. Because no matter where you come from in the world, nobody has this design. Nobody has a constitution where they designed a country from the ground up where the people were empowered over the government. And that's what the veterans protect. Our families, our destiny. Now, if you're frustrated with government, join the club. I, uh, I, I think it, it sometimes frustrates me too. And then I remember, we designed this country to have an inefficient government, one that doesn't do what we want it to do all the time, full of compromise, full of people who are average people, just representing their constituency, which doesn't always agree with our constituency. And it was meant to be inefficient and ineffective and unruly for a reason, so that it wouldn't become too powerful, so that you, the people, would remain more powerful than the government. Now, we have a fight right now. Some people think the government needs to be more powerful and decide our fate, even conservatives, because if I'm in power, I should be able to tell businesses what I think, and I should be able to win. But quite frankly, the veterans got it. When I was in the military and when I was a Marine, yeah, I was a conservative, but we understood our role. Our role was to keep the peace, to preserve our union, and to give the people a time to heal and to debate the topics. Thank you, veterans, for doing exactly that, for remembering that we're just a part of this and that Thank you, by the way, for those families, those, those men and women who stayed home while we deployed. Because I'll tell you, uh, I'm just going to come clean. I've been through a divorce. I was gone for two and a half years of my marriage, and uh, my wife took care of the kids while we took the glory and people thanked us. Um, I'm going to just take a time out to say thank you for those families who borne that burden of, of not knowing where your husband or wife was uh, not knowing how to pay the bills, not knowing how to take care of the kids all the time while we're out doing what we're supposed to do. God bless you and thank you. <laughs> There's a, uh, a special thing when, when that happens right now when, when we talk about service to our country. Um, do you ever wonder why military veterans have such a hard time with depression and suicidality after they leave the military? What is it that, that drives us to that sort of hopelessness? Because that weighs heavily on my soul. And, and, and to see that fewer and fewer people are experiencing the military now, uh, all-time low in percentage of population. We're a vol voluntary uh, service. We don't make our mark, except for the Marines. They have the best commercials. <laughs> I might be biased. Um, but. They're having a hard time making their mark right now, and people aren't drawn to the military. And you can see an overwhelming number of people that are anti-American inside of our country, that are anti-Israel, anti-Semitic. Uh, you're seeing people rise up. It seems like the 70s all over again, doesn't it? Where you see an inordinate number of people protesting other Americans, where you see people with racial strife, where you see runaway energy prices, runaway uh, inflation, does this sound familiar to you, like the 70s? We have people hate the police, people hate the military. 
But out of that came a new messenger and a new message. And that person wasn't focused on things that divide us, but on things that unite us. The freedoms that made America exceptional. And you had him quoted right here in a video opening up, which was a phenomenal video. And ironically, that guy didn't even serve in the military. He was an actor. Now, if an actor can spread a message of hope and freedom, and really from 1964 to 1989, the message was the same. Smaller government, defeat communism. Pretty simple. But also there was a reverence for those people who served, who got it right, who understand our natural God-given demand was to serve others. And that's where your happiness comes from too, by the way. If you're in a church and you're just living your life and you're thinking you're a good person, you kind of miss the whole point. The whole point is service to others. The reason we come to church is not because God needs you here. It's because it gives you a community to serve. And when people are down, you get to interact with them. And people have stopped meeting right now because they're used to the Internet. I hope we don't stop meeting. I hope we get the younger generation involved because they're used to getting on Facebook and figuring out how many friends they have, how many hits they have, how many clicks they have and a lot of self-glorification, how pretty I look, how much money I can make. And unfortunately, we've even raised our children to think it's about them. And that's probably the problem we have right now. Most of us were raised by the greatest generation. We're taught that we're supposed to scrape the house and paint the house, mow the lawn, trim the hedges, and that's without an allowance. Now we've told our children that they're going to be amazing people. They're going to be rich. They're going to be famous they're going to be powerful. They're going to be beautiful. It sounds great. That's what we're told, telling them to do. And then when they get to all that, they commit suicide. Why do movie stars commit suicide? Why do politicians commit suicide? Why do people of great power and influence commit suicide? Because it's not about me. It's not about the individual. It's not about how successful I am. It's how successful we can make others. Even Paul said it. In the way he wrote, he said, I'd gladly give my life, I'd give my salvation up to bring others to Christ. Because he understood that faith wasn't about him, it was about other people. It wasn't about how perfect he was because he admitted all the time, I am the least. I persecuted Christians. He talked about everybody else. And so with that, I want to lift up my fellow veterans for understanding what's important, for understanding service above self, understanding there's something bigger than what we define ourselves by but what we define others by. When my sons hold doors for other people, it's not to make them feel good. It's not because that person deserves it. It's because it defines them. I don't treat my dad well because he's a good man. It's because it defines me, not him. That's what the Bible calls us to do, and that's what we as Americans are called to do, to lift each other up. And I will leave with this one final message. If you take home one thing from what I'm saying today, we need to transform the political process right now, and it's not going to be won by an argument. I believe I'm factually correct. I believe I can beat anybody in an argument because I'm right, but it doesn't matter. Because not one person is going to be convinced by anything I say. I can be totally right. But if they don't think I care about them, if they don't think I love them, there's not one thing I'm going to say to them they're going to believe. I have zero influence. The idea that I'm going to get online and convince somebody who got online at the same time as me that they're an idiot and that I'm right is outrageous. When I went to Morehouse School of Medicine, I became student body president after four years with my peers who were 60% female, 80% black, and 95% liberal. I'm probably the only Republican who won in a D plus 95 seat. <laughs> How did I win? Because relationships trump politics. If you want true influence, don't try to win an argument. Try to win a friend. Because once somebody believes that you love them, you have true influence. Everything you say from that point on becomes influence. But if you're trying to win an argument, it doesn't matter how right you are. It doesn't even mean, even if they want to agree with you, they're not going to agree with you because nobody wants to be proven wrong. The veteran gets it. They're there to love, to serve, to protect. So for all you Army guys, carry on. For all you Marines, hoorah. And for all you Air Force guys, keep sitting in that chair and do your job. <laughs> Thank you.
God bless you guys. Semper Fidelis.